So yes, good evening. How is everybody? Big shout out to those listening on the Ats on This TV audio experience as well. Appreciate you listening. If you couldn't be here live, those who are here live are in for a treat. As I was just saying then, it's the book club tonight. I've got the awesome book, If I Could Tell You Just One Thing by Richard Reed. Lowry, good evening um, on my iPad here. I've only got 22% on the iPad here, guys. I'm hoping that holds out for the duration it should do ipads are pretty good on there on battery but i've not even turned it on yet just in case um for yeah i was just saying so richard reed basically was the co-founder of innocent drinks decided he was going to go out and visit 70 or so of the most remarkable people on the planet everybody from like president bill clinton to bill gates to richard branson to judy dench to olivia coleman um ruby wax i mean oh there's so many people in here heston blumenthal uh, Annie Lennox, Simon Cowell, um, David Attenborough, Andy Reid, uh, Katie Piper. Oh, I mean, just Andy Murray. Everybody from all different walks of life. Sportsmen, actresses, singers, dancers, businessmen, all kinds of things. Claire Fox, good evening. Good to see you in the house. And Dasha, thank you for joining us as well. Finally made it. it says I'm always in the wrong time zone. Well, you're here tonight. That's all that matters. Um, so, so, yeah, and what he did is he went out and he said, listen, if you could tell me just one thing about success about living a good life, you know, ultimately what's led you to, well, living a remarkable life, what would it be? And they sit down with him. Jude Law sat in his car with him for like 10 minutes on the side of the road in London and just basically told him this story. So he just snatched time from people and asked them to share, you know, the secrets of their success, really. So it's a really interesting book. We looked at, I think, three or four people on the book club before last. If you want to watch a replay of that, go to actsonlist.tv. Um, you'll find it in the uh, in the book club section there. You'll probably see it on the homepage at the moment if you, if you go there right now. But don't go there right now because watch the live one instead. Go there afterwards. And, uh, yeah, you can catch up on that. Would massively appreciate it if people would give this a share before uh, before we begin. Just give it a little retweet on Twitter. If you're joining us on Facebook, lots more people join on Facebook now than they do on Twitter. But if you're out on Facebook, massively appreciate it if you share it to your timeline or any groups where you think this would um, be of relevance, where people want to live a better life, be more successful, be more positive, be happier, ultimately, you know, just do, do more things with our life. Um, Appreciate you sharing it there. And now I want you to choose some names because we're going to be, um, well, you're going to be in control tonight. So you're going to choose the names of the people who you want to hear from. Um, and we're going to hear from them. I'm going to read you those chapters. So the people we've got to choose from are, and if you like these, thank you for sharing, Dawn. Appreciate that. If you like these people, just comment like with their name. Thank you for sharing, Richard. Um, and whoever gets like the, you know a few votes, we'll just we'll begin and read them. So we've got President Clinton. Um, we've got um, Terry Waite. Was Terry Waite the guy who was? He was a hostage, wasn't he, Terry Waite? Sure, he was. He was. Uh, he was. He was hostage. That'd be an interesting one. Um, Heston Blumenthal, the the chef, Simon Cowell. I think we had Simon. We might have had Simon Cowell last week. Oh, God, I should have realised who we had. We definitely had Joanna Lumley and Liver Coleman last week. Um, Let's have a look. Who else have we got on here? I'm trying to think. David Attenborough, um, Richard Branson, Katie Piper, uh, Andy Murray, tennis player, the Dalai Lama, could be a good one. Um, Alexander McLean, uh, Edna O'Brien. Don't know who Edna O'Brien is. Um, Joe Malone. The woman who did the whole Joe Malone thing, she came, and she a billionaire, I think that from from now from from doing Joe Malone, uh, Bear Grylls, born survivor, uh, Mickey Hart, Claire Balding, Jude Law, um, who else have we got here? Michael McIntyre, he had his watch robbed off him recently, didn't he? Um, oh, Attenborough says Gary, um, Annabelle's here as well. All right, good evening, Annabelle. Um, and thanks for reminding us, Bobby. Yeah, we had Liver Coleman, Joanna Lumley, and James Corden last time. So there we go. So we haven't had Simon Cowell. So I've got Andy Murray, Dawn says, Attenborough, and uh, let's have Annabelle says she's bought the book as well. Loves Esther Perel's. We might read that. Um, right, so who do we want? So we said, so you know what? Let's have a look. So we, let's read Attenborough and Murray. We can probably get a couple more in, but yeah, let's get to... Uh, David Attenborough. Let's see what he uh, what he said. And I haven't read any of these at all, so um, this is new for me as well. So here we go. Richard Branson and Bear Grill says says Hayler. Right, okay, Rich. I think they're they're good choices as well. But let's definitely read Branson's because um, I like him. He's a good man. So this is David Attenborough's, and it's titled "The Lesser Spotted Sir David Attenborough." 
are very apt. It says, all I can hear are the sounds of nature. The air is filled with mysterious chirpings and squawks, exotic whistles, tocks and clicks in quick succession. A Ghanaian giant squeaker frog, <laughs> a Madagascan side neck turtle and a Pakistani snow leopard dart past in front of me. Then a Papua New Guinea war- warrior in tribal headdress appears. Our eyes meet. He gives me a friendly smile and comes towards me, extending his hand in a traditional greeting. And I think, not bad for a Tuesday evening in West London. Bit weird. Admittedly, the sounds are recorded and the animals are on film, but the warrior is very much real and enjoying both his first trip in London and his first ever gin and tonic. We're at the Whitley Awards for Nature and Oscar Light Awards ceremony for rising stars in the world of conservation. The venue is the Royal Geographical Society, an appropriate choice given the far-flung origins of tonight's nominees, each of which has dedicated their life to defending their threatened native species. The Ghanaian chap uh, protecting the giant squeaker frogs has even learnt to mimic their mating call and does so loudly when collecting his prize. It makes for a memorable acceptance speech. It's interesting, isn't it? When you get your uh, BAFTAs and your Oscars, are you going to make a mating call? Be a bit weird. Peter Krellin and Tony Rossi from Chicago in the house. Good to see you, lads. So whilst the evening is shaped around celebrating these conservationists and their projects, the biggest draw of the night is guest of honour and the world's most revered naturalist, Sir Richard... No, not Richard Attenborough, Sir David Attenborough. He's dressed on brand in a crumpled cream linen suit, looking for all the world like someone who has just come back from exotic travels, which of course he has. He's at the event to support the conservationists and wants no limelight for himself. Like his documentary subjects, he seems more comfortable hiding in the long grass and remains in the audience, avoiding the stage. To talk to uh, him one-on-one, he is the charismatic yet humble man you'd imagine him to be. He says he gives time to these awards every year, including narrating each of the Conservation Project's films, because local people with local knowledge and a vested interest do the best conservation work. And, to quote him, it's more important than ever to support those who protect the planet. It's lost on no one that the, roo- um, that the room is full of people inspired to do just that because of the films Sir David has made. The effect is global. President Obama credits Sir David with awakening his fascination in the natural world as a boy and asks Sir David to the White House to pick his brains on conservation and fulfil a childhood ambition of getting to hang out with nature's commander-in-chief. According to Sir David, the growing encroachment by man on our natural habitat and the ever-increasing demands we place on the environment has got progressively worse over his 60 years of filmmaking, what I'm seeing going on with plastic at the moment, it's shit scary, isn't it? It's pretty bad. We've got to stop stop using plastic. I just refuse to use plastic straws now. Karen Allen, good evening. Um, and he's clear-sighted about the fundamental driver of the issue. So he says, there's no major problem facing our planet that would not be easier to solve with fewer people. He also underlines the importance of appreciating what is around us, not just our natural history, although that is, of course, of fundamental importance, but also our art other people too. He recommends what he calls an explorer's mentality, delighting in and savouring, delighting in even, (laughs) delighting, delighting in and savouring all the riches of life as we journey through it. And while doing so, heeds, it's a good idea to create more than you consume. Now that's freaking good advice. I think for every actor out there as well, create more than you consume. Okay, I think there's two types of people in the world. There are the creators and there are the consumers. There are the consumers who will sit in front of Netflix and watch every show, binge on it every single night, wishing to hell they were in it as an actor. Um, And then there's those people who go out and actually create the version of that show for themselves until they get elevated to be in that show. There's also, says, a boyish mischievousness about uh, David. When he asks for his best piece of advice, he feigns ignorance and says he's never been able to think of anything clever to say his whole life, and then winks. When I push a second time for his most valuable advice, he continues in the vein of what he has been saying about appreciating the miracle of what life on Earth has to offer, and it fits exactly with the endless fascination he exhibits in every second of his films. Now, this is his advice. It's short, but it's sweet. Ready, he says, I have never met a child that is not fascinated by our natural world, the animal kingdom and the wonders within it. It's only as we get older that we sometimes lose that sense of wonderment, but I think we would all be better off if we kept it. So my advice is to never lose that. Do what you can to always keep that sense of magic with our natural world alive. 
and no one does that better than Sir David. I think it's really powerful, isn't it? Like we do. I think in the acting industry, this is this is so true as well. As kids, we have such an imagination and wonderment, and we play and we improvise and we do all that stuff because we're not inhibited. And then we grow up, and people just shit the pants. It's like, oh, I can't be seen to do that, or I can't be seen to play around or be a bit childlike or you know or you know you just lose you get too serious don't you and you just end up losing the wonderment of the world around you sometimes I say this all the time like it's incredible when you step back and just realize how amazing like the whole thing actually is Myra says she's having a little bit of a screen freeze Looking good for me Myra where I am anyone else having that if you are having that Myra and you can hear me just refresh the screen um, hopefully it'll be all right and turn off anything else you've got on your phone that might be taking up your bandwidth. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's interesting that definitely I'll read it again. Cause I just think it's really, really, really good. And, uh, Myra, if you missed it, this is for you. This is what David says. I have never met a child that is not fascinated by our natural world, the animal kingdom and the wonders within it. It's only as we get older that we sometimes lose that sense of wonderment, but I think we'd all be better off if we kept it. So my advice is to never lose that. Do what you can to always keep that sense of magic with our natural world alive. I saw a kid, you know, I was walking the other day um, and I, uh, I saw a kid on the, like standing on the back of his younger brother or sister's pram and the dad was pushing the pram along. And this kid, he went past me and I smiled at him. He looked like he was having so much freaking fun as in to go look at me, this is amazing. And it was something that was just so simple. And that was the thing that I think we lose if we're not careful. We just lose the simple, fun things in life because we think we get guilty sometimes. And I feel this myself sometimes. Sometimes genuinely, because I know I have, I want to achieve a lot in my life and I have a lot of plates spinning, a lot of businesses and careers and things. Sometimes I feel guilty for having fun, like genuinely. Sometimes I'll be like, right, that's it. You know, if I take more than like an hour out to go and do something fun, sometimes I can easily, I mean, even like right now today, find myself berating myself, going, no, you've got to get back. You've got to do this. You've got this to do. You've got that to do. You've got to get the vlog edited. You've got to put this out. You've got to do that. Sometimes you just got to remind yourself that actually, you know what? The only person putting those deadlines on me is me. Um, and it's all right to have fun in it. It's all right to just enjoy yourself a little bit and not lose that wonderment of the world, but I think we live such fast lives and we demand a lot from ourselves that sometimes we can get like just caught up in in a treadmill of work, you know, and, and nothing else. Tony says, oh my God, me too. Feel it, Tony. Honestly, I, sometimes I that I'm working on like personally for myself because I really feel it. Like I feel guilty and I'll be out having some fun and I'll notice like, for instance, someone's like put something online and it might be something that I go, God, I really respect that. Or like, haven't they done really well with that like Instagram post or that piece of content they've made or someone else, else has recorded a podcast or I catch someone else's episode of a vlog and it inspires me because I'm like, wow, that's actually really good quality. And I think, holy shit, like I should have done that. I should be doing like, I, I better go home and do something <laughs> <laughs> to kind of keep up so it's like it's, it's weird isn't it? we've got to let ourselves off sometimes Myra I'm sorry your, your, your screen is freezing Gary says it's fine on his end everyone else seems to be and it's and it's great I've got two screens as a test got this one here you can see and I've got one on my laptop and it is fine um yeah maybe like just have a look if you've got anything else on in the house that's maybe downloading something in the background like any other apps or like your iPad or anything like that turn it off um and just uh or switch on to 4g data if you've got that on your phone and don't use your wi-fi maybe it's just your connection's a bit dodgy um gary says force myself not to work at weekends sometimes oh makes me makes me antsy just thinking about that gary <laughs> uh do you know what i did do today for the first time though i had a look in my calendar to have a look at where the next break in the vlog will be. Because I do a week off every 14 episodes of my vlog. So every 14 weeks, I take a week off filming my vlog. And the next break, as the 14 weeks, ends up the first week of August. And I thought, that's when everyone's really going to be on holiday. It's the first time I've ever thought of going, you know what? I'm going to just take those three weeks off of August as a break. Just unplug and we're going to hit it hard. We'll come back in September. And I would never have thought of doing that before. Uh, what do you like to do when you do unplug, Ross? Um, 
do you know, Tony, one of my most my favourite things in the world, I think maybe this comes from, from being an actor as well, well, it just comes from being curious, you know. I freaking love, like, observing people, and I love behaviour, and that's why I really go deep on the psychology of behaviour and, like, understanding. No one acts randomly, right? Nobody, any every action you have made today has been a reaction to something in your environment or something, you know, an experience in your past or whatever. Um, and you can explain every single action in people's lives, what they do, whether it's good or bad. You can explain it via one of four to six human needs they're fulfilling. I love when I want to unwind, literally, because coffee is one of my favorite things in the world as well. Going and sitting in a coffee shop and just watching, like, out the window, if I can get a high vantage point, just going and watching the world. I was sat in, in the local uh, coffee shop the other day watching chuggers outside. That's what we call them in the UK, people who, like, charity workers who try and get people signed up for various charities. And there was a few in the square near me, and I was watching how they they entice people in and how people react to them. It's like some people will run past them and kind of hide and pretend they haven't heard them. Other people will, you know, kind of fob them off and make a joke with them as they walk past. And some people will stop and talk to them. And I was looking and trying to figure out what the chugger was doing to make the person stop. Because that's, that's really useful information, how you influence people. What were they doing that was resonating with some people to make them stop and listen because if you can do that and you have that effect on people it's very very powerful so i love just chilling like that sitting in a coffee shop with a podcast in watching the world go by tony freaking love it um richard says get yourself scuba certified and i guarantee it will change your life you'll enter a whole new world of wonder and relaxation i promise you oh i've never ever i'm not a strong swimmer though rich but i've never ever thought of uh thought of scuba diving but maybe yeah give it. and my local gym my local swimming pool offers training that annabelle says i thought that was just me do you mean about feeling guilty when you're not working annabelle definitely not just you and myra's gonna have to watch the replay myra apologies but the replay will be online instantly after i uh, i post uh, well finish this broadcast um tony says so true i love being a standardized patient actor pretending to be a patient for medical students um for that exact reason yeah just observing people it's, it's interesting isn't it and gary says oh my god i did that the first couple of series what's that gary first couple of series of what you did you did what and bobby says i'm now tanned enough that i can say no what does that mean no hablo english to them what are you talking about oh i'm missing a few comments out bobby must have gone on holiday somewhere oh i had an acting teacher who admitted watching celebrity big brother to observe the wackiness of people i think that's why reality tv works so well because we are like fascinated by people and watching other people. It's why Gogglebox over here in the UK, Gogglebox for those in America, I don't know if you have it, but we have it here and it's basically watching people watch TV. It's such a crazy concept. You watch them watching TV and commenting on the TV. It's just weird, but it's quite addictive viewing. We did an episode of Watch Ross, my vlog, where it's called Goggle Ross, where we watched back previous uh, episodes of Watch Ross and what we, you know, what we liked about them. Um, Right, let's have a look. Oh, Bobby talks... Ah, so you talk foreign language to the chuggers so you don't have to... <laughs> so you don't get caught by them. Uh, right, so that was David Attenborough's advice. Don't lose the wonderment. I think it's fantastic. Absolutely freaking fantastic advice. Simon Barton is in the house. PB. Call Simon Party Boy. Legend. Um, looking at more advice, Si, from uh, some of the most remarkable people on the planet. We just heard from David Attenborough. He said basically... Uh, that he's never met a child who isn't fascinated by the natural world or the animal kingdom. And as we grow up, we lose that. And he's like, if he could advise anyone anything, it's not lose that wonderment of the uh, of the world. I think that's really, really good advice. So who else do we want to hear from next? Let's choose, no let's choose another person. We had, um, who were people saying before? Richard Branson. Should we have a look at him? Because we've not heard from Richard, have we? Let's, uh, let's, get, let's get Richard in the house. Let's find him. That's uh, Bill Clinton. Get him later on. Uh, Branson. Branson, where the bloody hell are I? Oh, the Dalai Lama. That, that's something I definitely want to cover at some point. I think he's got a lot of good advice. Come on, Branson. Where are you hiding? He's not there. He's not there. There's 70 of these people. You have to just bear with me one, one second. Just amuse yourselves for a second in the chat. That's not him. <laughs> Judy Dench. Richard Branson. Island man. Boom, there he is. Right, let's have a little... Um, and Bobby says he keeps mixing up Richard Branson with Charles Manson. 
Very, very different people, Bobby. So, Sir Richard Branson, island man, probably because he owns his own island, Necker Island. Let's have a listen. I first met Sir Richard Branson at his old house in Oxfordshire, where he was hosting a festival-sized party in the adjoining fields for his Virgin Atlantic staff. He was the inverse of the great Gatsby, stood at the gate, greeting everyone that came in, all 15,000 of them. For over four hours, he shook hands, kissed cheeks, welcoming all. The embodiment of one of his management principles, and that is, if you look after your people, they will look after you. These days, the place where Virgin staff dream of meeting the boss is at his official home on Necker Island, his family's private island, which nestles among the baby blue waters of the Caribbean Sea. Every year, a few lucky Virgin employees get invited. As perks go, it beats free tea and coffee. I'm on the island for a week, not as staff, but as a very grateful friend of the family. I can attest that whoever coined the phrase, it's better to travel than to arrive, hadn't been to Necker. Even the journey here is epic. You fly by propeller plane to a nearby landing strip and board one of several speedboats, full of friendly crew, loud sounds and chilled drinks, skimming over azure seas and nipping between islands until you get to the very last one in the archipel- archipelago, Necker. Sounds freaking great, doesn't it? Richard, Richard Branson, if you're watching this, will you be our friend? There's only like, it's probably only like 25 of us. Can we just, we can come and stay, surely to God. When you see it, you can see why God kept Necker to last. Two perfect crescents of virgin white palm-fringed beach trailing off either side of a verdant headland upon which the proud main house inevitably sits. And while photos online might prepare you for the beachside jacuzzis hewed from natural rock and calming infinity pools staring out at untroubled seas, what you don't expect is the overwhelming beauty of the wildlife Skies chaotic with bright birds of paradise, lemurs screeching calls for a suitable mate, an inland lagoon, 300 pink flamingos deep. I say this is a fussy, hard-to-please person. The place is literally perfect. It's where God would take his holidays. It's freaking amazing, isn't it? It also affords an opportunity to observe one of the world's most revered entrepreneurs close up in his natural habitat. And if there was one behaviour beyond the generosity and affability of this rare breed of business titan that stands out, it's the sheer dedication of the man to get the most from life, treating every hour as precious as a one-off gift to savour. And if you don't believe me, this is his typical day on NECA. So this is Branson's typical day on Necker. See if this see how this compares to like our days, okay? 6 a.m. Tennis with hot female tennis coach from Miami. Rich, you probably know her. He's in Miami right now. 8 a.m. Yoga on the terrace with resident teacher. 8:30 a.m. Breakfast with wife, children, grandchildren, and friends. 9 a.m. Kite surf round the other island he owns. He's now bought the one opposite Necker too, because one island is never enough, with son and son-in-law. 10 a.m. Head to private office with resident personal assistant and broadcast quality media studio, uh, studio to support the countless virgin business and charitable initiatives across the world. 1 p.m. Zip wire down from the main house to the beach barbecue with family and friends. 2 p.m. Poolside chess with whoever is feeling brave enough. Winner, Richard Branson. 3 p.m. Golf buggy back to the main house to work. 4 p.m. Second tennis se- session with hot coach. <laughs> 5:30 p.m. Feed the lemurs. 6 p.m. Necker tennis tournament with other guests. Winner Richard Branson. 8 p.m. Dinner by the pool. 9 p.m. Party in the main house. Sounds like a nice life. All this done with a flip-flop wearing infectious enthusiasm. It's like he's woken up that morning and to his great surprise and delight, he's found himself in this amazing paradise, forgetting the fact that he's the one who spent 30 years creating it. Over those same 30 years, he's also redefined the nature of business. Before Branson came along, the stereotype of an entrepreneur in the UK was a wheeling, dealing, Dell boy type. Branson changed that. He made setting up a business seem sexy, cool and fun. And most importantly of all, possible. His success, life and approach to business underwrites the ambitions of other entrepreneurs, providing a license to dream, to think what if. I catch him at one of his beach bars as his feet... Um, at the feet, no, at his feet, the kite surfing board he used to get there. 
He's talking with the bar girl making the drinks. He finds out she's going back to the UK, but he's worried about a lack of work. So he starts making calls, offering to help her get a job. It reminds me of a time when I was one of the judges alongside him on a young entrepreneur's competition. And we debated who should win. He made sure extra money was found so everyone would get something. It's nice for a minute. The man is relentlessly helpful. The answer is always positive. His informal title in his own organisation is Head of Yes. Yes! That's wicked, isn't it? Richard Branson, not CEO. He's just Head of Yes. Nice. His most famous words, screw it, let's do it. Anyone who's got me on WhatsApp will see that's also on my WhatsApp. Um... Because he, inspired by him, I didn't just make it up. Um, But when I asked for his most valuable piece of advice, it's not specifically about work and business, but about life and how to live it. Maybe it's the Eden-like setting we're in, or more likely it's because he follows his own advice that we're in this island of earthly delights. So this is Branson's piece of advice. If he could tell you just one thing, this is what he'd say. People talk about work and play Oh my God, this is so apt because we've just been speaking about this. I told you I hadn't read this. Wow. People talk about work and play as if they are separate things, with one being there to compensate for the other. But all of it is life. All of it is precious. Don't waste any of it doing something you don't want to do. And do all of it with the people you love. So read that again. People talk about work and play as if they're separate things with one being there to compensate for the other. But all of it is life. All of it is precious. Don't waste any of it doing something you don't want to do. And do all of it with the people you love. As he says this, I can see in the distance, one by one, his family, friends and PA zip wiring down from the headland to join him on his private beach for another lunch in the sun. And I think to myself, for the hundredth time, this man knows how to live. Boom. So that's Branson's advice, basically. Work and play are both important, are not necessarily the diff- like different things. Um, I think for the most part, I feel that my work is play and play is work, but sometimes I just, yeah, just like sometimes things that aren't related to building a business, I'm a bit like, oh, I should be doing that, as opposed to, do you know what, maybe it's just a little bit like, just accept that actually having fun is building yourself, isn't it? You know, it's building yourself as a person. And that's why one thing I won't, I will never relent on is like not doing my run on a Sunday. That for me is like absolutely non-negotiable in my calendar. It gets done every Sunday because it clears clears my head. Um, I look at that as work and pleasure of the same thing. I have to do it to be focused for work, but it's also I- immensely pleasurable for me. Um, but yeah, good advice from the brand. So let's see what's going on in the comments. Um, my respect for you is increased by 5% after that impression. Who did, did I do an impression? Of what? Of Alan Partridge? I do Alan Partridge impressions all the, all the time, Bobby. If that was it. Ine is here. All right. How are you doing? Um, Gary said he did snorkel him once on a holiday. It was lovely. I've never done it. My brother's done it a few times. He used to love it as well. Um, definitely. And um, Richard says, yeah, diving will help everyone with their acting, writing, performance. The lot opens up an entire new world. Under the sea. We could all go snorkeling with Rich and just do a... Um, a, a live action play of the Little Mermaid. If you're fit, Rich, you can be Sebastian. Don't know who I'll be. Definitely not Ariel, but um, Bobby, you can be Ariel Little Mermaid if you want. And um, so, yeah, good advice from from Mr. Branson. Who else do we want to look at? We've got. Oh, it's only half past. We've got time for two more. Let's do two more. So, so um, let me see. Let me read a few more names out. Uh, what did people say before? There's someone else. Uh, said they wanted wanted somebody um, who I'd already read out. Let me see. Let's get this. Let's get this in the bag here. So other people we can hear from if they were going to tell us their one piece of advice. We've got people like Caitlin Jenner, Nicola Sturgeon. Bloody, I wouldn't mess with Nicola Sturgeon. She's a little Rottweiler, isn't she? Um, Ruby Wax. We've had. Oh, Bear Grylls. What about Bear Grylls? He's a bit of a warrior, isn't he? So we've got Bear Grylls. Jude Law. Jude Law, Bear Grylls. Uh, James Rhodes. I think he's, a, he's the piano man. Um, Dalai Lama. Joe Malone. Um, Mickey Hart. Claire Baldin. 
Andy Murray, Katie Piper. Katie Piper was really interesting, wasn't she? Katie Piper was the first girl like to have a massively public acid attack, wasn't she? She's was a beautiful model, um, and yeah, I'd, oh god, man, I mean, it's dreadful. It's happened quite a bit of a spate of it, really, but um, recently, but like, yeah, acid attacks totally changed the way she looked, and um, it's changed changed her life, but like in in many many positive ways as well. She's used it for for real good because it could have destroyed destroyed her, I'm sure. Um, Let's have a look. Um, Annabelle says she's never heard of Esther Perel, but she's got good advice. Richard wants Bear Grylls. We said Bear Grylls. Let's do Bear Grylls, and then we'll do a toss-up for Esther Perel, Andy Murray, and Jude Law. We'll see. Uh, we'll ask for votes on that one. But yeah, let's do uh, let's do the Bear Bear Grylls, Born Survivor. Bear Grylls, Born Survivor. You could be forgiven for assuming that Bear Grylls, ex-soldier, Everest climber, world-renowned survival expert, and adventurer. Would be a bit macho. Bit like myself. <laughs> Hardened by his time as a soldier and his many brushes with death, but 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 he isn't, but not so. I wouldn't be so stupid as to call a bear a bit of a softy, especially when he's sat right in front of him, but he has a warmth and gentleness you don't necessarily expect of your typical SAS commando. We're chatting backstage after Bear has just talked to hundreds of teachers about tackling Everest at a young age. He reached the summit at 23, 20 years after a skydiving accident in which he fractured his spine and was told he may never walk again. Didn't know that about Grills. Richard says Bear Grills proper geezer. Um, yeah, I didn't know that about him at all. And the source of his drive and resilience was that accident. Interestingly, when you hear him recount his adventures, there's no bravado. Achievements are downplayed. Credit for them is assigned to others. And he portrays himself as someone who constantly struggles along the way. In Bear's world, struggling is okay. Struggling is all right. I think you've got to struggle. It leads to success. And that's what he says in the next sentence. Struggle that leads to success. Um, there's always going to be someone faster Someone smarter, taller, more experienced than you. But the rewards in life, they'll always go to them. The rewards in life go to the dogged, the determined. Those who can keep going and pick themselves back up and never say die and just hang in there. Sometimes quietly and undramatically. One on one, his humbleness remains, and while not shy, he comes across as someone more comfortable heading up a mountain than to a cocktail party. First and foremost, he's a family man. Much of what he says relates back either to his parents or his experience of being one himself. His introduction to the world of adventure came from his dad, who took him climbing when he was young. Bear loved the bonding experience with his father, quite literally showing him the ropes. It was the first time I found something I was good at. I never did well at school, he said, but I could climb higher than anyone else. It opened him up to a life of being outdoors, going on adventures, getting muddy and doing a job I couldn't even have dreamt of back as a young boy, he says. As with most people who have a career that um, that professionalises a relationship with danger, he's extremely respectful of the risks he takes. He makes it clear that he didn't conquer Everest. We didn't conquer anything. We made it to the top by the skin of our teeth and got away with our lives where others hadn't. Four people he knew died on that mountain at the same time Bear was climbing it. Wow. He lightens the mood by recounting the time he proudly showed his mum the photo of himself at the summit of Everest, a picture taken after a gruelling three-month expedition with days spent in the death zone, gasping for air, knowing each footstep could be his last. She took one look at the shot and said, Oh, Bear, it would have been so much nicer if you could have combed your hair. <laughs> yes. I love it. I love it. Oh, something, something, that's something my mum would say. Mums will be mums, he says, smiling at the memory. He accredits parts of his ability to endure uh, the hardships of his adventuring to his faith while he points out there are no atheists in the death zone. His quiet Christianity is something he calls upon uh, oh, he calls, he calls upon away from the mountains on a daily basis. I know I can't depend just on self-confidence. By myself, I'm not strong enough, but developing a confidence in something much stronger than me gives me more power. So I start every day on my knees just quietly asking for help and wisdom and to say sorry for the things I got wrong yesterday. He's non-evangelical about, he's non -evangelical about his faith, but opens up about it. Um, and it has to be said, gives God some great PR opportunities. When one of his all-time heroes, President Obama, came on his Running Wild show to raise awareness of climate change, as well as schooling, Mr. President on the dangers um, of fornicating bears and the benefits of drinking urine, 
He also asked um, if he could pray with the president, who as another man of faith and family uh, values readily agreed. Given his approach to faith, family and friendships, it's surprising that Bear is sometimes the target of criticism for his TV shows, which some claim promote um, machoism. Um, mach- oh no, how do you say that? Machismo. <laughs> That's what it means, being macho. And the spilling of blood and sweat and tears. He's no time for that negativity and says anyone who thinks that's the takeaway from his programs is missing the point. He says what his TV programs show time and time again is what he also puts forward as his best piece of advice. This is it then. It's not the most masculine macho or the ones with the biggest muscles who win. It's those who look after each other who remain cheerful in adversity, who are kind and persistent and positive. These are the characteristics that help you not just to survive life, but to enjoy it. And they're nothing to do with gender. The people are successful, who are successful are the ordinary ones that just go that little bit further, who give a little more than they are asked to, who live within that extra 5%. So I'll read that again. That's the Grillmeister. It's not the most masculine macho or the ones with the biggest muscles who win. I wish you'd have told me that before I just decided to go to the gym every day, try and get bigger muscles. It's those who look after each other, who remain cheerful in adversity, who are kind and persistent and positive. These are the characteristics that help you, not just survive life, but to enjoy it. And they're nothing to do with gender. The people who are successful are the ordinary ones that just go that little bit further, who give a little more than they are asked to, who live within that extra 5%. Boom. Pretty good. Good advice from the Grillmeister. Just give that little extra, that extra 5%. What do you reckon to that one? I quite like the Grills. Um, didn't know he'd done a show with Barack Obama, though. but that was a bit of an interesting one. Um, brilliantly put there, says Rich. Gemma wants Andy Murray. It's one vote for Andy Murray. Jude Law, Bobby wants. Got two for Andy Murray now. Gary wants Andy Murray as well. You have to let me know what you uh, what you want. Um, ever hear of Pollyanna, the children's book? The lead character plays the glad game. Find something to be positive about in every situation. Positivity. It's the only way. The only thing there should be, Bobby. Negativity will never, ever serve you practically. I mean, it's just pointless. It's just It's not about being all airy fairy and all just be positive it's just actually from a really practical level being negative about shit ultimately just never helps so that's why there's just no point in deploying negativity it's not about being all amazing it's just about going actually you know what at zero point no time ever is being negative and whiny about a situation regardless of whether you've caused it or not is it ever going to help you so there's just no point you might as well make positivity louder and find you're right, find something to be glad about. Pollyanna knows knows a shizzle. Um so yeah, right. I mean that's good, isn't it? Good advice off 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 bare grills. Who do you want next? Last one for tonight. So we've got basically the three are, I guess, Jude Law, Andy Murray. And did someone else want somebody before? I can't remember who it was. Jude Law, Andy Murray. Do you know what? I can't find any I can't find the comments if there's been too many comments since. But yeah, let's go Jude Law or Andy Murray. Get your votes in now. I'll keep an eye on Twitter. If you want to put your vote in Jude Law or Andy Murray, speak now or forever hold your peace. Dawn wants Andy Murray. That's three for Andy Murray. Jude, you're not very popular tonight. I hope you're not watching. Well, I hope you are watching. I mean, that'd be good. But don't, you know, don't worry about it. People do love you, Jude. Just not as much as Andy Murray. Anyone else? Any more for any more? Oh, Bobby's gone for Jude now. Oh, Rich wants Jude. It's two all. The next vote's going to clinch it. Totally came in halfway through the conversation, says Paul Sparks. Paul, don't worry, you've joined at a perfect moment. Paul, do you want to hear from Jude Law, Andy Murray? Now Lee Ball's got Andy Murray, now it's three all. Or is that two? No, it's not. Andy Murray's got it. I can't believe Guys, I'm sorry, those who love Jude, because of Lee, jumped on Twitter and just shouted Jude, uh, shouted Jude Law. No, Andy Murray. Andy Murray's got it. We'll do Jude Law next time, though. Oh, mate, this is supposed to be the last week on this book, isn't it? You have to just bloody buy the book, I'm afraid. If you want Jude Law, it's a pretty good one as well. I have actually read Jude Law's. Um, he gets in the side, he gets in his car in London for like ten minutes. Uh, Richard doesn't just chats to him. So Andy Murray, 
He's a bit monotone, Andy Murray, isn't he? He's very, very good, but he's a bit... Uh, like, you know, he's, he's Scottish, isn't he? So he's like, I, I can't really be bothered to speak. And uh, But I'm sure he's inspirational. Um, he's achieved a lot, hasn't he? Um, you're a mean jelly bean, RG. Well, you have to buy the book, Bobby. Unfortunately, I'm not sponsored by uh, the book, otherwise I'd uh, get a commission. Stephen Gidwayne in the house just joined us live for Andy Murray. Um, Draft Breaker, it's called, this title. Don't know what he means by that, but this is this is Andy Murray's... Um, oh, now Dawn wants both. If we've got time, Dawn, I'll try. It's Andy Murray's advice. If he could tell you just one thing about having success in your life, is is what he'd tell you. Well, there's a story behind it anyway. Is there a sport tougher to master professionally than tennis? The brutal training schedules that start in childhood and don't stop till you retire. Your life constantly on the road, away from your family and friends. The very nature of the game itself. A modern day duel. One person pitted against another. No teammates to share the load. Hours of battling day after day under intense scrutiny. And the mathematical, illogical, maddening truth. That even though a match can involve over 250 points... Each point can prove disproportionately significant. Tennis is arguably the purest, hardest, most unforgiving of all sports. Then imagine if you've decided to take all that on, decided to shape your life around that sheer unlikeliness of making it as a pro, turned down the tempting football training contract you're offered at an early age and foregone all other paths through life. Just as your hard work and sacrifices start to pay off and you rise up through the ranks thanks to a quirk of fate, it turns out that your time coincides with not one, but three kings dominating at the highest level. A cartel of tennis dons, each showing unprecedented levels of success, skills and consistency. Knowing that in any other period of time, your own talents and mastery would make you champion many times over, but the universe has served you a dodgy line call just when it counts. What do you do? If you're Andy Murray, you take it on the chin and you do what you've always done. You get back to work and keep practicing, keep improving. You get forensic with your technique, break everything down to the smallest detail, work out how you can get the most from each muscle, each meal, each mind technique. Somehow you absorb and redirect the extraordinary pressure of expectation, channeling that energy instead into chasing every ball. And the result, you become... That fourth king, starting with Olympic gold. Then that first Grand Slam victory at the US Open. Then on the fifth championship point, the most coveted title in tennis, if not sport, Wimbledon. Um, the Holy Grail, you become the nation's rainmaker, ending a 77-year drought. Oh, not draft, yeah, drought. Wish I could read before. Drought, he said. Um, for the country. Then three years later, with the British public fragile and fractious from months of bad news, a second Wimbledon victory, playing better than ever before, and the world begins to think, maybe you're just getting started. So there's probably no one alive who means and fundamentally inhabits his own words of advice more than Andy Murray. And this is his, his advice. So he's a pretty, pretty tough and bloke. He says this. Whew, always believe that when you apply yourself, you can achieve anything make sure you give 100 percent and work as hard as you can in everything you do not just in what you enjoy but also in life and don't forget natural ability will only get you so far there is no substitute for practice from the guy who turned practice into perfect so one more time always believe that when you apply yourself you can achieve anything and that sounds cliched like so many people say it was freaking true make sure you give 100 percent and work as hard as you can in everything you do not just in what you enjoy but also in life and don't forget natural ability will only get you so far there is no substitute for practice from the guy who turned practice into perfect it's really true. And I was saying this on the vlog last week. I was saying, listen, people can be born with more talent than you. People can be born with more money than you, a better upbringing than you, a better schooling than you, etc., etc. But the one thing that you can always do, regardless of any of that bullshit, is work harder than them. It is like the thing that can give you back all of your control of your situation. You might have seen someone this week achieve something that you would like and you've gone, that's because they've got money and they could do this and they could do that. You can achieve what they've achieved um in most in most circumstances it might take you a little bit longer if you just put the work in 
the thing that's really tempting to do is just to not bother because you think you have this fear of process. We've done this before. You've got three main fears, really. You've got fear of change. You don't want to change because we don't like change as human beings. Fear of process is, oh my God, this is going to be a massive task for me to do. And you have fear of outcome as well, which is what if I go through all this and I still don't make it? It's it's better for you and safer for you in your head because you want to protect yourself from all of that hurt to not try because then you can just blame it on other stuff as opposed to, look, I actually sacrificed everything, gave it 100%, and it didn't, didn't come off. I promise you, if you sacrifice everything, give it 100%, even if the epitome of the thing that you want doesn't come off, something very close will, you'll be in a much better position than you were without trying. Um, so you've got to, uh, yeah, practice, practice, practice. What are you saying, Lee? I didn't practice there either. I missed your first comment, mate. I don't know what you were referring to. Um, Gemma says, yeah, it's Will Smith's moss. So yeah, Will Smith said that something very famous, didn't he? He said, he said talent... Um, uh, what did he say? Uh, hard work will beat talent when talent isn't working hard or something along those lines, I think he said. But it's really, really true, honestly. It's the, it's the leveler of all society if you just actually put the work in. Most people don't want to for one of those three fears. Um, so, uh, so yeah, again, it just comes back to the fact that you're going to die. I don't want to put a downer on it, but got to stop walking around like you're coming back and you've actually got something to lose you haven't got anything to lose i mean literally nothing none of it's going to matter that's the whole thing that i remind myself of all the time none of this is going to matter just isn't none of it's going to matter we're just we're only here for such a tiny tiny amount of time in the grand scheme of things just don't worry about like losing because there's no such thing really you're gonna get something out of the process regardless do you know what Let's read Jude Law. I don't want to deny anybody of what they wanted tonight. This is the last time we're going to be looking at a chapter in this book. Go and buy this, though. It's called If I Could Tell You Just One Thing by Richard Reed. It's a good book. Or get it on audiobook or something. It's just a really easy read. It's going to inspire you. If you read one of these chapters a day, you might just go out and just, you know, attack the world a little bit harder than you would have done had you not read it. Jude's Law. On the day we meet, time is running out for Jude Law. Not in respect to life generally, but on his parking meter. To avoid the faff of finding loose change and reparking, we decide to sit and talk in his car pulled up on the side of Shaftesbury Avenue, a kind of poor man's carpool karaoke. We chat about our respective childhoods. I mention I grew up in Huddersfield, and to my surprise, Jude says he's going there at the weekend. No disrespect to my hometown, but it's not normally a place where international movie stars go to hang out. When I inquire what takes him there, he explains it's to meet with the uncle of a young Syrian boy who Jude befriended when he visited the jungle, the makeshift refugee camp in Calais. The child refugee in question has seen his mum, dad and siblings die in the crossing from Africa and was in the camp all alone, so Jude offered to pay the legal fees and oversee the process of getting him out of the camp and into the arms of his one remaining family member up in Huddersfield. I mean, that's just something to be incredibly grateful for, isn't it? People sacrificing literally everything to give their child a chance. Anyone who's just like freaking born here... You know, a bit of perspective. The fact that Jude went several times to the refugee camp in the first place is doing all this personal. Uh, is doing all this personally for the young lad, and most tellingly, it only comes up in conversation because of an unlikely coincidence. That says a lot about the guy off screen. It's not like he was bragging about it. In fact, Jude Law has a long history of going the extra mile to support important causes. On previous occasions, he travelled to the Democratic Republic of the Congo and to Afghanistan with the peacemaking organisation Peace One Day. He was part of an initiative that managed to broker a 24-hour ceasefire agreement between the Taliban and the American military in Afghanistan, the result being that during the brief cessation, 10,000 health workers were mobilised and inoculated 1.4 million children. Wow. In 24 hours. Wow. He puts his track record of stepping out of the limelight and into pretty tough places down to several things. One is to make sense of this strange thing called fame. I'm in no way comparing myself to him, but my hero, John Lennon, said, if you're going to poke a camera in my face, then I'm going to say something important. That's the worth of media and fame, to help important things get noticed. He also says, uh, so that's what Jude was saying, he also says if he were to stick to just the movie star life of five-star hotels and VIP experiences, then he would feel fat with guilt. On the most basic level, he has a curiosity about the world and a desire to engage with as many different aspects of it as possible. His perspective is essentially, why wouldn't you want to go to these places? The ethos of experiencing life for its own sake is echoed in his advice of people who want to make it as an actor. 
there is such a large amount of luck needed to get your moment, so you have to be in acting for the right reasons. Do it because you love the thing, the process, because you'll enjoy doing a no-pay play in a room above a pub. You have to be happy doing it that way, because what happens otherwise if you don't get your break? He says it's having that love of the actual thing that will keep you sane if you do make it, because otherwise it can fast start to feel like a business, and you'll need to keep that original flame alight or you can lose your way. When I asked for his single best piece of wisdom, we revert back to talking about his childhood and, his, and he credits his dad with his favourite piece of advice given to him as a young boy. Oh, <laughs> this is interesting. If you're going to be late, enjoy being late. If you're going to be late, enjoy being late. Let's see what he means by that. It was a piece of advice he meant literally that if you are late, rather than panic and get stressed, enjoy the extra time it is affording you. But as of a piece of advice, it has served Jude as a wider metaphor for life, reminding him to relish the moment, be in the moment, do the right thing in the moment, whatever that moment is, be it a refugee camp, a room above a pub, or the set of your latest blockbuster. And with that, he has to go, he's running late. <laughs> so there you go, even Jude Law's late. But if you are late, enjoy being late. Ultimately, just enjoy the moment, folks. Again, another piece of advice you hear a lot, but how many people do it? It's really easy to, to give that advice out. It's difficult to actually practice it. I'm guilty of, of not being in the moment enough sometimes myself. I think we all are. I was saying before, it's so easy to get caught up in the rat race, isn't it? And on the treadmill of, of life and work. Uh, reminds me of the story where Shirley Temple got 400 people over the Czech border because the guards were fans of her, says Bobby. It's amazing. Honestly, it's, it's like... I think that must be the most rewarding part of having massive success. You know, when you're really known, it's not about going, oh, I'm earning loads of money and everyone adores me. It's like, I've thought of this a lot. I've thought, what, what could I do if I was more well-known or more successful in that sense of, you know, uh, I mean, it's not, that isn't success really, is it? There's many versions of success. But, you know, if you ended up on, with a bit of a break on a big show, and suddenly you ended up with, you know, a million Twitter followers or a million Instagram followers overnight. What you could actually do in order to influence those people and that following, like, and how you can you can utilize that, almost like the death, the death star, like aim it at things to go, right, woof, I'm going to aim all of this energy at this cause to raise awareness of this, to make the world a better place. I think that's like probably the most rewarding thing about being well known and having that kind of success. It's got to be, hasn't it? the impact you can suddenly have. Because then suddenly life's not about how much money you can earn or what you can buy and all that sort of stuff. It's got to be, and it shouldn't be ever, because that's a proven formula for failure, really. Any Anytime you are chasing money and money is your prim primary motivator. For me in my life, when I set up businesses earlier in my life, in my like late teens, and the, and the whole point of them was to make money, they failed really quickly. Whereas that's on this is seven years old now. And this is this is live broadcast 268. And I think the reason most people are here tonight who have been here so many other times and those listening on the audio experience have probably subscribed to the podcast and downloaded lots of other episodes is because like my primary motivator here is not money. I mean, this is free for a start. That's on this. It's such a charitable aspect of it. You know, yes, you can pay for some of the content on there, but the money gets given back to great causes and stuff. I, I actually make very, very little. Well, don't make any money out of that's on this, to be honest with you. Um, it just pays for itself to run. Um, and yeah, the, the, the point, that the, the reward that I get is the impact, getting the emails from people on a weekly basis going, wow, I listened to this and it changed my perspective on this or it finally gave me the guts to reach out to this person. I've now got an opportunity. Um, I think Jude's right there. It's like, you know, it's what you can do with that, with that fame um, or, you know, some kind of positive notoriety. Uh, what you can do with that, that, that is the real win there. So that's um, that's advice from four great people tonight. Um, here we have Bear Grylls, Richard Branson, Jude Law, and Andy Murray. Um, if you want to hear more great advice, go get the book. If it's called uh, "If I Could Tell You Just One Thing" by Richard Reed, um, it's a good one. It's definitely one of my favourite books that we've done on uh, on the book club. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who's watched the thirty fourth episode of my weekly vlog. Watch Ross today. 
Um, it's an interesting one. You'll see me finally get the keys to my new apartment on this vlog. You'll see me sit down with Petch, my videographer, as he talks about his play that he's putting on the first show he's ever put on on his own for the Greater Manchester Fringe. Um, the pitfalls of that, what he's learning from that. You'll see us sit down with Shaw, my business partner as well, who's gone into the corporate world at the moment, away from entrepreneurship for a little while to do a different project. And it's not for him. Uh, <laughs> you'll hear his uh, his opinion on that. Ultimately, that is spending time doing something he doesn't like. He's going to be out of that very soon. Um, so, yeah, go check it out. And if you actually subscribe to the vlog, um, I'm going to be paying for someone's spotlight or I'm going to be giving you £150 in cash. If you go over to the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash watch Ross, and you hit that subscribe button, every comment you leave on an episode... Um, of the vlog is an entry into the prize draw i'm going to draw someone at random at the end of july and then you're going to get 150 pounds put in your paypal account or um, i'm going to pay for your spotlight subscription if you're an actor if you prefer that um gemma says good luck with the move loving the vlog i'm starting mine just finding my feet at the moment amazing gemma we'll share it with us once you've um you know once you once you've got it out there would love to uh, would love to see it um and don't don't worry the thing with the vlog um is don't overthink it. So many times when I was first starting doing this, I was like, I've got to create a spectacle. I've got to, we've got to manufacture something or I've got to make it entertaining. You'll notice as we go along, I mean, basically we just vlog what's happening that day. I mean, it couldn't have been more normal what I did on this vlog, which is basically try and get the electricity working in my apartment. And you might think, holy shit, this is going to be really dull and boring. But you'll find that actually, you know what? If you just choose like interesting parts of your day, it's actually quite interesting. I mean, I watch it back and go, oh, I thought it was going to be really dull, but actually, like, it's quite interesting. Um, so don't overthink your vlog. Like, you've got to manufacture stuff. Just pick the camera up, film, and then you'll overshoot. You'll, you'll have way more footage than you need. Just cut out, like, interesting parts of conversations quite quickly and stuff, and you'll end up with something that's, you know, that's really uh, interesting. Gary says, poor Sean. That was pretty funny. I'm going to show you here. Here's a 60-second clip of my vlog. Very normal this week, basically. Try to sort the electric out in my house. And sitting down with Petch, talking about his play, and Sean talking about this job. But here's 60 seconds of it. It's quite interesting. I was landed with a 900 quid debt that wasn't mine. The only reason I'm slightly concerned is that uh, the amount of debt which I think is still outstanding is around like 800, 900 pounds, okay? Oh my pounds. God. Uh, yeah. Ah, Petch, welcome to the crib. Come on in. So yes, he has finally bought the apartment, got the keys, it is mine. You know what I said about being inspired by where you live before, Fetch? Thank you for your patience. Your call will be answered as soon as possible. Not feeling as inspired. How do you get 900 quid in debt on your electric? You've got to realise that no one is going to care about your project, your career, you know, anything in your life as much as you do. And in a way, you can't expect them to. I'm going to make the apartment amazing. It's going to be an inspiring place to work. We're going to get stuck in. We're going to build our businesses and ultimately, you know, like, design the life we want to live. Boom. So there you go. Just 60 seconds of it. Um, you'll be seeing a lot of that apartment over the next few weeks, basically uh, refurbing it, turn it into an inspiring place to work, to uh, run online businesses from. You know, my acting career, all kinds of stuff. I'm going to set up a little studio in there to interviews so we can do podcasting and stuff in there as well. So, you know, you'll see us uh, installing equipment. If you want to get into voiceover, keep an eye on it as well. It's going to be um, talking about the stuff that I'm buying for it in order to use to set up a little studio, etc. Um, how many hours do you shoot for each vlog, says Gary? So we normally shoot, Gary, on a Tuesday. So we're shooting tomorrow and it's normally about... Oh, probably about nine hours, mate, 10 hours. And then from that, we edit a 30-minute episode. So there's so much on the cutting room floor, like loads of stuff. And sometimes I'm like, oh, I'd love to put that in. But like, I don't want any episode really. Some of them are just over 30 minutes. I think when you start getting way above that, unless it's a special like interview episode where we go and sit down with someone for a long time and they've got a lot to offer. I don't really want episodes to be longer than 30 minutes. I mean, give us some feedback on the episodes. Are they too long? Would you like it if they were shorter? Or are you happy to go, you know what, I'm happy to sit down for 30 minutes and you know, have a have a long blast, or do you watch it in, in sections? Maybe you watch 15 minutes here and then 15 minutes there. Um, let us know what people think. The the viewing figures on YouTube in terms of the minutes of, of the vlog that's being watched suggest that when people are watching, it's only maybe like 500 people a week watching, but it is suggesting that actually people are watching the whole thing. So in the last 30 days, 20,000 minutes 
of Watch Ross has been watched between 500 people. So it's actually, um, it's not people jumping on and watching two minutes and going, this is shit, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit. Otherwise, I'd have made the, made the episodes much shorter by now. But the, the, uh, the actual analytics is showing that people are watching the whole thing. And sometimes I see people going and watching one episode and then watching um, a couple. So yeah, Lee just said, I usually watch one or two at a time, but don't watch it each week. So yeah, people have done that. Watch your vlog this morning, 30 minutes is just right, Ross says Dawn. Amazing. Yeah, people do that, Lee. I've seen people, honestly, it amazes me. It's really humbling. Some people will go on, they'll leave a comment under one, and then I'll see them go and watch another three or four episodes in the same day. I'm like, wow, you've just given me like three hours of your attention. It's like incredible. Like It's humbling to go, people think that this is interesting enough to to give three hours to it. So um, it's amazing. I love doing it, and we're just going to continue to do it. I said when I started off, I was going to do 100 episodes. It's two years of vlogging. Um, after that, I'll review it and see where we go from there. But um, but yeah, I'm, you know, I just really enjoy doing it. It's, it that isn't work, just going out and go, Petch, film me. It's a bit weird, though, when you... <laughs> When you go out on like a Wednesday or a Thursday when we're not vlogging and something good happens and you're like, shit, why isn't Petch here now? If he just could have filmed this, uh, it would have been great. But, you know, you can't capture everything. Um, Gary says, like the half hour episodes. Um, awesome. It's what I watched during my Monday workout, says Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Appreciate that. Um, and Lee, you asked a question before just as I went to the clip to that video. I can't remember what it was. It was an interesting question I wanted to answer. What did you ask on Twitter, Lee? You said something about the vlog just as i cut to the clip before and i thought when i when that clip finishes i'm gonna i'm gonna answer that question remind me if you can remember what it was uh i can't bloody remember it's gone it's absolutely gone um but yeah appreciate people watching the vlog and um, do subscribe like i say leave a comment i will absolutely um be choosing someone at random to give that 150 pounds to it's totally legit that's not some bullshit thing to just entice people into subscribing um it's uh it's legit i've i've given it already to two people in the past sandra rock one and uh ruth curtis one. Oh, that was a question did you tell the guy the on the electricity on the phone i was recording him no i didn't but he was recording me so i thought it was fair gamely i thought if you're recording my phone call i'm gonna recall your phone call as well he was a great guy what an absolute legend i think his name was oh was he david or jamie i can't remember his name or maybe it wasn't either i spoke to loads of people that day very very good awesome guy at SSE. One thing I will say about SSE for your electric, I don't know how competitive they are pricing-wise, but the customer service is brilliant. I mean, really good. I had someone come out and fit a, a new meter for me the day after I phoned up, um, and they sorted all that £900 worth of debt left by the previous owner of that flat. Um, sorted it all out like instantly for me. So little shout-out to that. Credit where credit's due. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. Thanks for uh, thanks for watching. Um, so that's it for tonight, guys. Appreciate you being here. It's just gone 10 o'clock. Love you and leave you. I'm going to be back next Monday for another live broadcast. Um, apologies, you lot, on Facebook as I just click off this to end the broadcast. I'm not going to see your comments anymore. Um, but thank you for uh, for being here. If I do anything for anybody, let me know. It's um, it's always at Ross A. Grant on Twitter, at Act On This TV on Twitter as well. Um, hit me up if I could do anything for you. Um you know get that book let me know what you think of the other chapters if you um if you do get the book if i could tell you just one thing um let me know which advice you like the best post in the facebook group if you're an actor and you need anything as well it's facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash act on this tv um you can uh by all means ask for uh ask for help there and what's going on here why can't i end the broadcast Oh, looks like you're stuck with me again. This happens quite regularly, doesn't it, when we do this? Let's <laughs> try and end the broadcast on Facebook. <laughs> just like, nah, not gonna uh not gonna let you do that. So I'm gonna have to just uh gonna have to just bear with me. I think they've changed a few things up here. Anyone else do any broadcasting via Facebook or anything like that? Or would you like to learn how to do it? As an actor, maybe like you know what, you'd be like one one night I could actually do like a little tutorial or something on um on how to actually broadcast because I, I, I it's a little bit more complex than just like the regular apps that you get i use some stuff that enables me to broadcast to facebook twitter and um, periscope at the same time i could also for what i could be going to youtube at the same time as this as well um lots and lots of uh of different places um if that would be useful then um you know let me uh let me know it's not showing me where this video is at all really isn't it's as if 
Book club, there it is. <laughs> it wasn't refreshing. It was as if it just this was a ghost post or something. There you are, fantastic. Um, but yeah, I can't see your comments now, Facebook guys. If you were saying that, would be useful. Let us know in the Facebook group though, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash act on this TV. Thank you for being here. I'll catch you with you very, very soon. Enjoy the rest of your night. Those in America, enjoy the rest of your day. And I'll see you live next Monday night, 9 p.m. UK time. Until then, bye for now. Oh no, wrong button. <laughs>